Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. This is hashtag keep the flame alive with three uh, police officers, one's retired, two are still active. Um, that's Paul Steven Sensei who's retired. Now, um, I've known all three gentlemen for a long time. They're very accomplished martial artists and also experienced police officers. I'm gonna get each of them to tell you a bit about their background in Aikido or martial arts and in the police. So we'll start with Andra Sensei, please. Uh, good afternoon here from Czech. To start with my martial arts background, I started with Judo when I was 10, uh, which I did up to 19. And that was the only uh, Asian martial art which was uh, allowed in Czech in those days. Then karate came to Czech, so I started to train when I was 19 in karate, uh, and I'm still there till now. Then uh, after so-called World War Revolution, the door were open, so I had chance to study other martial arts like Kempo, and in uh, 1992 I saw Aikido for the first time. And because I was an officer at the police responsible for the teaching of self-defense and doing the um, system with the other team members, which is suitable for Czech police, I joined Aikido. Uh, at, it was Aikikai, where the French uh, man at that time. And uh, 1996, I met uh, Brian Stockwell Sensei from uh, Great Britain and he was uh, coming to, to check to teach seminars in our dojo and uh, for the summer schools. So that's a practically my background in martial arts. And the police I joined 1992. Uh, I've been um, doing the, the training, as a special officer as they call it, for a training. Then I uh, was in a paramilitary squad here in the local, uh, doing policing at the football stadiums. And I end up with uh, in uh, um, criminal investigation police, as they call it here, which is basically a detective squad for the uh, northern part of Czech. Okay. Uh, so. All right. Thank you. We'll come back to a couple. I got a couple of questions, but I come back to that. Paul Steven Sensei, your illustrious career in the police department and Aikido. Uh, so what did I do first? Um, I started with judo. Uh, no, I actually started with boxing when I was seven. Um, I was getting a bit bullied at school because um, everybody was into football. They're all London expansion, so they're all into Arsenal and Spurs. And my parents were from Cornwall, and they're not famous for football. And um, so I got a bit bullied. So I started boxing, and uh, that finished the bullying, which was great. And um, But then I got a bit cocky and uh, got beaten up a bit, which was uh, a very good uh, lesson you know and and then i started judo which was really good and uh, and then gave it a break while i joined the air cadets and then later um joined the police in 1983 and did my uniform for about two years and then got into uh, the crime squad and pickpocket squad so there's a lot of surveillance there and following off um pickpockets especially colombian pickpocket teams who are really accomplished and um, and then started Aikido in 1985. So with uh, Tony Yates Sensei in, uh, in, in Watford and London. And, um, and then had a career break from the, I, I made the CID, Criminal Investigation, in 1990. And then took a career break. I was one of the first to come to Japan and do the, the Century Say course. Um, for one year and then I wrote a report how relevant it was to police work so I extended it for two years three years four years um, and, and then went back and rejoined the police and started a, a dojo in in Camden which I have now um, I, uh, Yoshinkan London and, and you're retired now from the police so I retired in 2018 from the police after doing my 30 years contract um, so my experience in the police has been really from that uh, pickpocketing, um, I made CID, a couple of murder squads, went to Japan, came back um, and then went into intelligence, covert policing, informant handling, um, homicide investigation in North London, 
um, then made then went up for promotion and went back to local policing as a as a as a sergeant a detective sergeant and ended up uh, doing all various hate crime um, various different local criminal investigation areas uh, using proactivity as well so you know covert um, tactics and ended up in sex offender management. So we used to manage, we had 600 sex offenders, paedophiles, um, varying from paedo extreme paedophiles on one end that would snatch children off the street to students who get stoned and look at a bit of pornography at the other end. So, um, and we had to manage their risk. So it's a bit of social work really, because on the one hand you're looking, you're trying to make sure they don't offend and don't reoffend, And on the other hand, if they look as though they're going to reoffend, you use all your covert policing to try and catch them out and put them in prison so that they don't harm right, children. Don't, don't, don't hog the interview, for fuck's sake. Well, I'm old. It takes a long time. <laughs> he's, uh, all right. he's all right. Let him go. Bill, he's giving you a chance, Bill. Quick, get in there. Yeah, hi. So um, I, uh, I began martial arts doing uh, jujitsu uh, as, as like a young teenager and sort of did that. Got my show done in Jiu Jitsu, uh, did some boxing and some kickboxing. And then I found Aikido 1997, uh, training under Ken Robson Sensei at the Shudokan Nottingham Dojo. Um, through training with Ken, I met yourself, Sensei Joe, and Robert Mustard. Um, continued training from 97 through to 2014 under Ken Robson Sensei. And then I went. Uh, sort of my own dojo with my wife. Well, actually, 2008, we opened up the Eagle Dojo, which we currently still run today. But we run that as a Yoshinkan affiliated dojo, and uh, we're under Robert Mustard Sensei. Um, and the, so, yeah, that's my Aikido. Um, I've been in the police since 1993, still serving. Got three years till I retire, and I've mostly worked as a detective on child protection or economic crime. Uh, yeah, that's me. Okay. So, just just to add to the intros, uh, Andra Sensei, you're also the head coach of the Czech Karate team? I was um, head coach for 30 years, nearly 30 years. I retired from this uh, when I was 16, which is uh, around two and a half years ago. But I'm still some, they call it advisor for the national team. And you also used to be in, in the training for the police, you used to train the police. In, uh, yes, in yeah, that was the, the that was the purpose why I joined police in 1992. Uh, we had a team uh, of uh, different martial artists, and the task was to uh, build a system which is suitable for a common policeman working on the street as a self-defense. Okay. And uh, Paul, uh, he Paul, since I didn't mention, he was teaching in the Yoshinkan Hombu Dojo in Japan. And he taught the Senshu State course, he taught the riot police, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. What, what um, was your rank when you retired from the police? Uh, detective sergeant. So I just ran a team, okay. so I was kind of team, team leader. Cool. And Phil, what's your rank now? Are you allowed to say? Yeah, I'm just, I'm a detective. Okay, cool. All right. So now, just very, very briefly, can you? Tell me your your definition of Aikido. Not not what the books say, but what Aikido is for you. Okay? Uh, Phil, you want to go first before Paul jumps in? Um, so for, for me, really, it's just a, a way of bettering myself and um, bettering other people that train with me, really. Um, you know, the, the, it has to work. It has to be practical um, because I need it and I use it. Uh, but it has to be something that will make the whole areas of my life better. So not just about being in the dojo, but what I do and how I behave when I'm not at the dojo and, and how I can influence and help other people behave when I'm not at the dojo. Okay. Paul? Uh, that's a massive question, isn't it? Um, oh, you got two seconds. Two seconds, right. It's uh, Aikido is about grounding yourself and uh, controlling someone who's coming to like an attacker um, and uh, trying to take them off balance as early as possible. 
through through space timing and positioning and body structure. Okay, so that, that's technically. What about for you? Yeah. Well, that's for me. It's it's the grounding yourself is quite a thing because if you do it out of arrogance or if you do it without a uh, good foundation in belief or, or um, your integrity, let's put it that way, your personal integrity, then it doesn't work. For me, it doesn't work, you know, because you're trying to unbalance somebody when you're yourself, you're not balanced yourself. Okay. Andra Sensei? Well, two seconds. Aikido is my great love, Sensei. Uh, oh, that was, uh, it's true, yeah. But uh, Aikido brought me uh, a broader um, perspective uh, on the martial arts because what I did before was uh, more kicking, punching. Uh, so Aikido, when I saw it, even if uh, that was Aikikai, I felt inside that this is it. And then when, when I saw what uh, Brian Stockwell Sensei brought, which was basically the old way of Shurokan, he uh, trained with Ted Stratton. Uh, I felt even more comfortable and I saw the practical side which I can use for my work and for my teaching. Okay, so um, I'm going to come back to each of your definitions later, but it's hard to have this conversation without, um, I, I think we all believe that, you know, mind, body and spirit, it's one, yeah? So especially in Aikido, <coughs> mind, body and spirit, one. But for sake of this interview, we need to break it up into tactics or strategy and techniques. So the first thing everyone will want to know is, have you used Aikido on the job? And when I say that, I mean technically, uh, have you used Aikido on the job technically, physically, has it worked? And then we'll talk about the mindset and stuff like that afterwards. So we'll, we'll break that question into two, okay? So who, Paul, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I would say, um, I think for police, the police work I've been doing, it, it's been really frustrating because all the techniques you learn are about somebody attacking you. And, and in my experience, most people are trying to run away. So their energy is going in the opposite direction. And um, so Aikido is harder to use. But the fewer times that I have been attacked, um, there's a few times that I have used it. And um, I think that one, once I found a guy hiding behind a door, he was, he was wanted. So we've been looking for him for some time, found him behind the door. We thought the place was empty. His wife had opened the door, or his girlfriend was completely naked, trying to distract us. And uh, so we searched. So she's not here. He's not here. Went into a bedroom, opened the door, and then he came at me from behind the door. And uh, Idiminski was really handy. Just pinned him to the wall by the throat, basically. Searched him, then turned him, put him on the floor, and um, and then somebody walked in and went, "Oh!" And I said, "Did you see that? Did you see that? That's Aikido." <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't seen it. It's not, I don't think it's a show off -y type martial art Aikido. It's a, it's a quiet one and you tend to do it when you, you don't expect to do it. And were you distracted by her? Not at all, I was very professional. Of course, yeah. Andras Nense, have you used it technically? Uh, well, uh, let's say I have used Aikido techniques several times uh, because I worked seven uh, years in the anti-drug squad by the criminal police. So that means we have been involved in many fights <laughs> and uh, many arresting people who really didn't want to <laughs> be arrested. And um, most of them were under the drugs, very high. So you can't um, count with the pain because they didn't feel pain at all. So I used several times Aikido techniques and most of the times they worked. Okay. But uh, to, to be honest, uh, if you speak about martial arts, martial arts are about non, not fighting. But now doing a police job, you have to go and you have sometimes to attack a first. And you have to use what we call controlled aggression. And it's not very, uh, very much complying the, the true uh, ideas of martial arts. Okay, we'll come so back to that. Yes, but we'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Phil? Yeah, uh, like, like everybody else, several times, you know you're in a situation where you, we can't run away from that conflict. We have to be there. Yeah, that's our job. So, so we have to stand our ground. Um, and we also have to make sure that what, what we do is not going to hurt anybody. So like Andre Sensei said, kicking and 
punching is no really good. Uh, so Aikido is perfect for that. Um, before we even get into like putting hands on anybody, uh, I use Aikido all the time to put myself in a better position um, than the person I'm going to be dealing with, whether it's even just somebody I'm going to speak to. You know, I, I want to look at all my opportunities to give me like the control of that situation. But what people want to know from us really is physically have we used Aikido. Um, a great example for me really is uh, breaking someone's door down who we needed to arrest, similar to Paul Sensei's. Um, it took, it took quite a while to get into his property, but to smash the door down, I first threw the door, ran into a room to be met with quite a big bloke who was holding a baseball bat like this, saying, come on there now, and using other expletives, uh, saying he was going to smash my aim with a baseball bat. I, I just stopped and sort of looked at him and said, yeah, come on, mate, put it back down. You're not going to get into this, but something similar to that. And, uh, and he put his back down and said, sorry, and then he was arrested and we went off. Later, my colleague said, wow, that was amazing what you just did there. And I was like, well, what did I do? I just stood in front of somebody and said, put it back down. But my colleagues described a completely different presence of person, like all my energy, all my power going forward, projecting onto his person. That's obviously something that I've got from my keto. In have to physically touch him to, to control that situation. Um, but again, um, actually hands on uh, you know i've had people come flying at me when they think they're going to be arrested and um, just taking their balance off them straight away and put them down and arrested them so um and i've got examples of my students using aikido too um but yeah for me practically it's worked all the time so far i don't expect it to always work i think like what andre sensei said people on drugs their pain compliance is different but if we take their balance and put them down then already we're sort of in a better position too I think for me is when it doesn't work, do you give in and pack up and say, Aikido didn't work? Or do you say, I need to go back to a dojo, practice harder, focus more, train harder? That's what you need to be thinking about. Uh, because okay, all right. if it didn't work, it wouldn't be here, would it? You run away with the interview now. Okay. Um, I'll see yeah, so in, in your definition, right, Phil, you said Aikido makes you a better person. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Tenter, you said about grounding and not being overly confident, overly egotistical, maybe. I'm reading between the lines. And Andra Tenter, you said it, it gave you a broader perspective into martial arts. You also said it wasn't about, about martial arts, not about fighting. So has those kind of concepts about bettering yourself and grounding yourself, has that helped you or hindered you in your line of work? When you when you know uh, when you've had to hurt someone, and I'm sure you have, you might not want to talk about it, but you've had to go hands on, you've had to be nasty, you've had to pull a side of you out. You know, working on the doors of clubs, I've had to do the same. So my question is, has the philosophy and the concepts of Aikido helped you or hindered you? Andre Sensei, you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, let's go from the other side. It helped me dealing with my subordinates, not only in a physical com uh, conflicts on the street, but when I had to uh, lead the people, let's say, and uh, nowadays I have uh, 1,320 people under me. Uh, so there are many, many problems, personal problems, professional problems. And it was Aikido, which helped me, which uh, tried me to dim down my own aggression and to receive what they like, what they want to do, and use it this way. And this is for me much more worth than those situations when I had to protect myself physically. Andre Sensei, I can't see you needing to protect yourself. You know, I, hold on. people can't see you. What, what do you bench press? Well, now I um, do a, a, a little bit only, 120. But in those days, it was 180 kg. Okay. When so, I was fit in the police uh, on the street. 180 kg is three of me. Right? Why would you need Aikido technique? I still need them. Because you, you can't just use a brutal force. I, I, it's being a policeman, you can't do that. 
there are lots of CCTVs and cameras and all those things. And if you smash somebody, you'll get fired. Pension is gone and everything. Yeah, we have, we have a- we have a duty of care to the people that we're trying to arrest. So. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Okay, so what about you, Phil? Has Aikido hindered you or helped you? The, the, the philosophy of Aikido and, and the, you know, the mental side. I, I personally, I think it's helped me. But if I think about situations where I've been at jobs where people have been aggressive, verbally aggressive, colleagues that have arrested people fairly quickly, I, I've, let, I've let them people be more verbal towards me perhaps because I've been like you're not really bothering me you know you I'm calm about it because I don't see you as a threat and other people have seen that so uh, perhaps I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing if I'm honest Um, yeah Paul before you you go on I just want to tell you where the point of this question is from when I was working in clubs it actually hindered me because maybe it's my mentality maybe it's my Aikido training but I couldn't start something. Hmm. People would get verbal, they'd get really aggressive. I couldn't start unless they touched me or touched one of my, 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 my crew. Then yeah, I, I think that's what I, yeah. yeah, so in that way, that Aikido mentality I found hindered me. So that's the, that's the base of my question. Paul, sorry, go, please. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I used it every day with, um, when, you, when you're dealing with aggressive people, which was quite a lot of the time, um, if you put yourself in their mind, when they're being aggressive, they're expecting two responses. Either you're going to compete with their aggression and, and fight with it, or you're going to be scared and you're going to show one of those two things. Now, if you're completely deadpan and you're just open and waiting for an attack and talking to them normally, and they're displaying like, a, like, a, you know, like an animal and, um, and kicking off and you're unaffected by it, I would say 99% of the time they back down because they, they've never faced that before. They expect the two responses, a binary response and not nothing, you know? So when you approach them and it has no effect, that has a big effect on them. And, and then when you start speaking, you, you bring it down. So, you know, a lot of it is, is talking, especially in the UK, we haven't got guns most of the time. Um, so a lot of it is just talking and being neutral and not, not playing their game. Don't give the power to them. Don't let them control it, which is very Aikido uh, based. Okay, so uh, mo- moving on, yeah. Um, pain compliance, right? Is there is there a, a place for it in in law enforcement technique? Is there? I'm not talking about excessive stuff. I'm talking about a certain amount of pain compliance. To I've got my own ideas on this uh, to get people to do what you want them to do. Phil? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and that's, you know, we, we, so we get taught certain techniques that we can use to restrain people and then techniques come with pain compliance. Um, but we're not looking for someone to tap out, we're looking for someone to stop completely and be in a position where we can put handcuffs on them. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of the sort of like, you know, sort of the self-defense that we get taught within the police it, it is sort of, I would say, based around sort of e or like gooseneck locks. So definitely a place for pain compliance. Okay, Andre Sensei? Well, I think it depends on the situation because I've held a man, I felt that two millimeters and I will crack his hand and he didn't feel any pain. He didn't respond. So I end up just hugging him and waiting for the other guys to, to come and help me because no Nikajo, nothing worked on him. So uh, it depends on the situation. Mm. Okay. And I have had another case where we have been arresting guy who had a sex with his own mother. He was thrown out of a, of a, a priest seminar. He was a pretty weird guy. And I held him like this. Uh, and what happened before, it was on Monday and on Saturday he was, he was using a percussion a pistol to shoot on a policeman. And he lived from Saturday till Monday in his own ideas that he killed the policeman. And when we went for him, I held him like this. And I felt that just a small touch will crash his windpipe. And he didn't react at all. Hmm. So uh, we have to be very, very careful uh, if you bet on pain or not. 
in this kind of cases. Okay. So I, I'm not very, very um, keen friend of that using using this. Paul? Yeah, I'm not a big fan. It, it was taught to me as well in the police to use it, but um, it's very limited and you can sometimes escalate situations when you do. Um, we were taught that, you know, all these, the, these pressure yeah, yeah. points are for, for protests, um, ironically. Um, but but I, I, I think it was more as a, as a distraction. So if you want to, like, for example, I had a guy holding a mobile phone. He was trying to call his mates to come to the house to fight us, basically. So he's holding a mobile phone. So I kind of grabbed, grabbed, went for the mobile phone at the same time doing soccer men. And that works a treat. You know, the, these kind of double things, you can use pain very, very effectively. So you use pain in one point, distracts their attention whilst you throw them off balance. Um, I, I, I've hurt people and haven't got a result. You know, when, when they've got too much of that or whatever, it hasn't worked. But there have been other times when I've spoken to people, I've moved them out without hurting them, and they've come back in. I move them out again, they've come back in. The minute, instant I hurt them, they get the message. So I think there's, there's room for pain compliance, but like Andra Sensei says, depends. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you hurt someone, <laughs> if, you, if you hurt someone enough, they, they look at you and, and start to believe in you so, and take your orders. Anyway, look, um, reasonable and proportionate force. Um, okay, so. Is this, a myth? Is this a myth, Sensei? <laughs> okay, you can go first, please. Is this a myth and loyal trick? Because if uh, this is what the law says, that you, ha you have to use reasonable force and et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it is a myth because if you are in the situation, it's better to be judged by 12 rather than carried by eight. So uh, you have to protect yourself uh, well enough. And it is very, I know that the people say you are an expert, you are black belt in that, in that, you have to uh, judge the situation properly and use the proper amount of force and strength. But um, those are theoretical people who haven't been in the situation when you are surrounded by the crowd, for example, during the policing, the, the, the football matches, when there are roadies and they're attacking you, you have no time just to, to decide this is appropriate or this is not. That's my experience. Okay. And then so the lawyer gonna... comes, then the yep. lawyer comes, you have a fraction of seconds to react and they have a six months to inspect the case. Okay, so since I'm, I'm we'll not very keen on that. that. It will come back to that. Uh, Bill? Well, exactly what Andre says, but it, it, if you like have the scenario that a guy breaks into my house and swings a baseball bat at William, who is age 11, whatever he's going to do, would that be reasonable compared to what I did? Would that be reasonable? Uh, because William's capabilities are different to my capabilities. So it, reasonable doesn't really exist. Proportionate is what exists. And proportionate, again, based on, based on what? Based on how... Andre can bench press three of you, uh, me and you will have to get him to do it for me too. Um, so again, me and him have got a different proportionality in what we can achieve. It, the truth is that what, what they say is you can't judge what's proportionate you, uh, or what's reasonable. So you can't judge what's reasonable because it's different every time. You have to do what's proportionate. And that would depend on are you being attacked by somebody with a knife or are you being attacked by somebody with a feather duster. Proportionality is different in every case. But reasonable don't exist. Okay. Paul, you're smiling. I was just imagining somebody attacking Phil with a feather duster. That's all. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> I think reasonable. Re um, it, it depends. If somebody presents a risk to you, once you've taken that risk away, as a general rule of thumb, it's unreasonable to carry on kicking their head in. You know, I think that's a general thing. So once the risk is being dealt with, it's unreasonable to carry on unless you're trying to restrain them for police to get there. Um, uh, one, one, an, an additional point uh, that I, I get really irritated with, with by people who are not police is when they talk about um, why did they shoot a man with a knife? They could have shot him in the leg. That, and I know that, you know, once somebody has a lethal threat, so if they said they're going to kill someone, they're having a mental health breakdown, for example, they're extremely dangerous, 
They're faced with a police officer. They turn around to run away. They have to be shot. And nobody really understands that in the public. They just think, oh, you've shot a man in the back. But the, the thing is, the police are responsible if he goes and stabs somebody else. So they are, they are technically responsible for what he does if they let him go. So and, they and have Paul, to, so you, said, you, do you think someone to stop, not to do, kill. Do you think people realise how quickly you would bleed out and die if you got shot in the uh, arteries in your leg? Um, not that yeah. the police are trained to shoot in the legs full stop anyway, but you know, you know, I've seen videos of people shot in the leg and they're dead within six, ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of uh, ignorance out there. So, so Sensei, would, would the, Andra Sensei, would the laws be the same in the Czech Republic? Like what, what Paul Stevens Sensei said, if, if someone pulls a knife, then as a police officer, you're responsible for what they do with it afterwards, if you let them go. Am I saying uh, it right? Well, more or less. More or less same, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, it, it depends. You have, to, you have to solve the situation according to your possibilities and your training. That's what our law says. So, for example, if, if you are sent somewhere and uh, the situation is too dangerous, uh, theoretically, you can refuse as a policeman. But practically, it's a little bit different. And the other thing is about the reasonable power. Uh, we have been talking about being attacked. But imagine there is a guy sitting in a pub, drunken, and he don't want to pay and he don't want to move. Uh, this is what we call passive resistance. And you are sent there to solve the situation. So you have to use the power to tell him out, but you can't hurt him. So there's the other situation. So there are, so there are big var varieties of situations in the police work. And it is a very uh, <clears throat> difficult to um, give one or only a couple of answers. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I know all these questions are like, how long is a piece of string? So, but what, what Paul Stevenson said about you being liable if someone has a knife and then does something else with it, the, the general public wouldn't know that. I didn't know that. So, yeah, no, but on, it, the other hand, uh, on the other hand, it, it, it depends on his previous behavior. Mm. If yeah. he's not mad or he just holds the knife and he's going away, so is there a reason to shoot him? So you have to judge uh, the situation from all points of view, what happened before and what is possible, what's not possible. It is really quite complex for me. Okay, yeah. So Paul Stevens and say, now that um, you're on the other side of the fence with XR, right? What's it, what's it feel like to be on the other side of the fence seeing what, what you and your the police officers were thought for so many years being being done on, on people you now support. I'm, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but what, what's that feeling like? To, to be the UK now that you're not the Shte? Uh, funnily enough, it's more like being Shte because um, we present the police with a dilemma. So we present ourselves as a protest group that is doing trying to save life in the future. So, um, so our integrity is quite sound. And when the police then uh, are overstep the law uh, or they're a bit too forceful, then they look bad in the press. So it's very Aikido-esque because we present ourselves, they run at us, we t turn a bit and they fall over. You know, it's, it, is quite, it is quite similar. So it's more like being shte, I would say. And there's a lot of harmony on the edges. Like I stopped this guy from, uh, this, this police officer I got into chatting with and he was like pushing us back and, um, and I said, uh, you know, do you know, do you understand why we're here? Do you understand why we're, 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 we're protesting? And he said, yeah, uh, my family's from Bangladesh and uh, we're going to be underwater in 10 years. I studied um, ecology at university. I know exactly why you're here. I'll be with you if I wasn't a police officer. I'm just doing my job. So there's a lot of harmony, you know. Police officers are normal people and they have views on things. They might not be able to get political, but, you know, and so we don't see them as the, the enemy unlike the far left who see the police as a representative of the government and they are the enemy. I, I'm not like that at all. It's about, um, you know, we're all, we're all human. And that's exactly what Oeshiba Sensei said, you know, we're all, it's all one universe, one energy. 
um, nature, humanity is, is all one. So we have to work together. Geez, you've changed. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Um, as a, can I just add? Yeah, what, sure. what, what, what people probably sometimes fail to realise too is these situations that the police find themselves in, or not necessarily always the police, it's dark, it's raining, something's happened, you don't know, quite know what, but you know that somebody's done something bad. And when you're in a dark alleyway and you're faced by that person, we get seconds to make decisions. And what we judge and do in a second, we're judged on in the cold light of day when people have a chance to look at cameras and look at what the press is saying and look at what everybody else is saying. But, but we don't get that luxury. We have to do something in a split second. Okay, so, so tell me, what, uh, what gives you the, the ability to make those choices? What, what constitutes your threat, threat assessment? I, well, I know that's a really difficult question, but in any yeah. situation, give me a couple of things that constitute threat assessment. Threat assessment for me is not just someone holding a knife. It's also who he's got behind him and who I've got behind me, the whole situation. Uh, for me, that's threat assessment. Can you elaborate on that? Because people, people think that if someone touches you, you touch them and you escalate the violence. If someone uh, pulls a, a weapon on you, you pull a weapon on them. I don't believe that. I, I believe it depends on your threat assessment and you, you, where you, you want to go from there. Sorry, go, Phil. Well, to be honest, it's, it is a very difficult question to answer. And I think, sort of, for me, I don't know how the others would see it, but physically putting hands on people, other than just most of the time when we arrest people, we say to them from a, from a distance apart, you're under arrest, and they say, okay, fair enough. And we put them in a the car and we drive off quite happily because they know that there's some questions to answer. It, physically getting hands on people and struggling and rolling around on the floor. It does happen and it happens probably every day but not to the same people every day and and so you, in within your career you will have had struggles and physically put hands on people but it's not a commonplace thing more often than not we're just judging the situation the british probably especially we, what we do is we talk to people and we um, because that's what we've always done we've always tried to be community-based resolve issues verbally it's only the extreme where we end up rolling around on the floor and that's what we're generally trying to avoid all the time so we're always during that resolution conflict where we're talking, we're always judging that situation and seeing where is this going to go to. You know fairly quickly when it's going to be a different story. And I think you, you know that too, Paul, and say that. You, you sort of have a feeling as soon as you turn up, you know how it's going to play out. What you try and do is manage that situation as best you can. Like Paul describes, you don't give them anything to sort of be aggressive towards and then it calms right down again. Sometimes you, you know, you're never going to win. And you know from the start it's going to end up being conflict. Also, you want to add to that, or um, yeah, I would. I, I think yeah. You, know, you talk about risk assessment, which is, you know, I, th I think it's it's more or less, it's having a quiet mind really. So you use your experience. You can listen to your experience. You can and you can listen to your senses, what you see, what you hear, the the emotion that you pick up. As soon as you're full of, you know, fear or excitement or testosterone or or um, you know, or you think you're going to get into a fight you can lose your ability to see things and to sense things. And I think that's, that's, that's where training comes in. So you can stay, stay level and you can receive the information and make your risk assessment. That, that's going and to that, take me to my next to question. Teach. Sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> that's not easy to teach. That's like, no. no. Andres, what do you think? Well, about? yeah, I fully agree with uh, both gentlemen and I uh, dare to quote Japanese saying, Hey, Joe Shin, so always keep your usual mind, which is very difficult in these situations. Uh, and I agree what uh, ha has, uh, has been said here. You have to judge on your personality, your experience, your training, and also on your condition, mental condition. That's also very important. Uh, if you try to stick to the Heijo Shin, it helps a lot. Yep. And, and everyone, if you've never been in an altercation before, you've got a split second or even sometimes no, it comes upon you and you don't see it happening. So, yeah, um, it's really hard. Yes. It, it is really hard. And you don't appreciate it unless you've been in an altercation before. And I think and when you hear... Phil, 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 
But, oh, you know, I've heard lots and lots of people saying, oh, yeah, this happened and then I did that and he did this and I did that and he did this. And I just think to myself, well, that's a load of rubbish because when it happens, it happens like that and you don't know what's happened. You don't know none of the bits in between. You just know that that's how it finished. Yep. So, Sorry, Andres, what were you going to say? Uh, I want to say there is also some uh, famous thing which I agree. Bad decision is better than no decision. So you always have to decide. Otherwise, no decision is the worst what you can, can you do at that moment. Mm -hmm. And you are sent there to decide and you are sent there to make decisions as a policeman. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now one of my last questions. Um, the training. Do you think the training that police officers receive is ample? Because recently in Australia, uh, a police officer, a female police officer and her partner asked another woman to wear a face mask. And the, the woman abused the two police officers. They end up rolling on the ground. She smashed the police officer's head into the ground a few times. Uh, her partner intervened. I, I'm not sure what her partner was doing or whatever. Maybe there were other people involved. But um, and, and is it lack of training? Is it... Um, and when I talk about lack of training, is it mentality as well? You know, like you said, Phil, you know, you talk to people from a distance. And we're not always going to get that, um, that luxury. Sometimes you, you're face to face, especially in nightclubs. So is, is the training ample, Andra Sensei? Well, I think the, the, the training helps you to be confident in the situation. And this is the main, for me, the main purpose of the training. Not the punching, kicking, locking, throwing people. But if you train, and if you are well trained, you are more confident, and you have the chance to, uh, to do right decisions. And you have the chance to manage the situation the right way. That's my opinion. And uh, I'm sorry to say, a lot of uh, common policemen here don't do their proper training. I'm not talking about special squads and paramilitary squads who are really trained all, all the time, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about the common cops uh, which work on the streets. Um, most of them, are, them underestimate the training. That's my opinion okay. uh, and, and, and my experience. Paul? Yeah, in the, in the Metropolitan Police, um, you get officer safety training once one day every six months and that's combined with first aid it is absolutely terrible mm. absolutely terrible i think they've just decided it well and it's always been that way since i joined really so you have to do something else um you can't just rely on what the what they give you in the police you know compare that to the keto tie who had to do one year eight hours a day six days a week you know well, that's well, we're going to come back to that we're going to come back to that yeah phil what do you think? It, it wouldn't be for me to comment on whether the police are doing things right or wrong. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Thanks, Bill. <laughs> okay. I've so, seen three years. I've seen three years. Um, no, this is, a, I, I don't normally do this, but I've got a separate question for each of you, right? And Phil, since you didn't answer the last question, you can go first. Um, Many people, especially the, the, the top teachers in Aikikai, like Doshu Kishimaru has said this. Uh, he said that Aikido is a non-fighting martial art, non-aggressive martial art. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you believe that? I, I think that um, to a degree I do believe it, but I also think that, you know, we say, that, we say to people that we don't strike in Aikido and, you know, it's not, it's not a fundamental thing that we do, but um, I think that uh, if we're going to use it, then we have to apply strikes. You know, when we when you move to the side and uh, block on like a yoke minuchi, that for me is not a block; that's a strike. Um, so I think that if somebody is being aggressive towards you and you want to use aikido as softly as possible and do all the stuff that's nice and soft, you still have to have an element of uh, strength within that and we spoke about this uh, before because how do we how do we practice to be soft in the dojo and go 
as smooth and like you know everything will be perfect when reality is someone's trying to take your head off and your even your body if somebody strikes you your body's going to tense up how can we how can we not be tense if we're in a conflict situation where we might actually die your, your body's going to have its own flight or fight reaction to that too so um okay thank, thanks for not answering the question yeah it's hard no no it's not hard i'm going to pin you down okay so I'm, I'm asking you specifically i'm not talking about striking i'm talking about the mentality uh, is aikido in your belief is it a non-aggressive martial art and if you said you did say you believe in that right yeah. so uh, yeah so i think do you, you think that guy with the baseball bat felt you were non-aggressive when he put the baseball bat down no i think that he's i think without trying to sound like big headed i think that he saw something in me that told him i'm probably not going to win in this situation so i'm not going to bother and That's you use that the, you use that as an example of aikido yeah but now you're saying you agree aikido is non-aggressive yeah it uh, mm. Mm, it's difficult right. isn't it yeah it's difficult yeah well because i because i give you another example really where you know i actually arrest somebody who was in a pub i was on my own i know that this guy's going to fight me uh, it's a busy pub all of his friends are in there it's, it's christmas eve he's not going to want to be arrested i've got to because i could make an assessment and say i'm not going to do it but there's nobody else going to come to help me i put the two tongues on i had the blue lights flashing outside the pub went inside spoke to him said mate i need to arrest you he said you're not taking me nowhere you, you know it's not going to be pretty i said yeah that's fine that's what i figured that's why i've got all my mates outside in the van you can see lights and everything outside but you know they're all going to come in in a second it's not just me and you all your mates are going to fight too they're all going to get their christmas ruined because they're going to get arrested you make a decision now do you come with me and save your mates christmas or do you fight and everyone gets arrested because ultimately you'll all get arrested he said can i finish my drink yeah of course you can finish his drink put some bracelets on went outside he said where's your mates so now it's just me he went yeah fair play so there's no aggression there, but I was ready to be aggressive, I had to be, because I went in there knowing that if my bluff didn't work, I will not coming out. So, so you just contradicted yourself, but we'll talk about that another oh, yeah. time. Yeah. It's, it's so, difficult, isn't it? Because it is difficult. It is, it is. If it was easy, I wouldn't be asking you the question, would I? <laughs> okay. Um, Paul Stevenson said next, yeah? So um, in the Yoshinkan, since the 60s, they've been teaching the Kidotai or the riot police. Uh, and it's a big part of uh, the Yoshinkan's um, claim to fame, et cetera, et cetera. You've trained alongside the riot police in, in Tokyo. You've taught them as well, right? Uh, I know you will say you haven't, but I know you have. Uh, because as, an, as a Seiwanin, you had to teach them as well. So can you tell us your idea? What, what, what was the course about? I've got my own ideas, but that's not important. I, I want to hear yours and the relevance. I think it's, I think it's endurance is a big thing. Like to train six days a week, eight hours, well, they had to do every class that's on the syllabus. That was their, their thing. And um, yeah, so a lot of it is just physical endurance. But because of that, they tended to uh, go along with each other in the training. It wasn't, you know, the foreigners got there because they had a vocation. They had a dream of doing a year's training intensive training in japan and uh, and they got there and they were quite aggressive and they wanted to you know i've come all the way from my country i'm going to show you that i'm strong etc and that took time to quieten down into real training um but the keto tie were kind of the opposite because they knew they were training for such long hours for so for so for a year um they they tended to cooperate a lot during their training so that, that's why they they teamed up the the foreign um, students with the keto tie, so you get a mix of both, and that that works quite well, I must say. And and the purpose of the course um, for the right police. They, all, all of the keto tie, they had to be uh, showdowns in other martial arts before they could apply. Um, I think it was just, uh, I think it was just a, a hurdle there to achieve to get into the right police, which was considered the the cream. You know, they dealt they dealt with everything from. Um, from bombs to everything. They were the creme de la creme of the Tokyo police. Our riot police, the TSG, they're kind of 
just one up from normal police. <laughs> they're not the creme de la creme. They're just uh, they just train all day and they uh, they like riots. But in Japan, they're you know they they got all the courses, fast driving courses, all the courses you can get. And just just to set the record straight, did the right police course did that one year course to uh, and just historically the first course we ran for two years in 1668 or 69, ran for two years, and then they brought it down to one year. Um, does that have anything to do with policing? Well, it's interesting that they combine policing with Budo, and you know, because you, if you do two years intensively, that has an effect on who you are and, and your ego and, and your ability to, you know, to deal with stuff. Um, Whereas in, in, in the UK, for example, I offered to teach police officers when I came over and opened my dojo in a police station and they asked me to leave because it wasn't quite the image they wanted for the police because it was a little bit, you know, dangerous and they didn't want the police to be associated with martial arts. They'd rather put the police out there with no training or one day every six months than, uh, than to be associated to something that looked bad. I mean, that's a complete different end of the spectrum, really. Okay. Andre Sensei, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, Andre Sensei, you once told me that you, you used a, a little story, you told me a little story, and you said that if you give a group of prisoners a key, some of them will use it to escape, and others will put it on the wall and pray to it. Um, can you elaborate that in terms of traditional martial arts? Elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, I've seen, because I was in many groups in my life, I'm, I'm more than 50 years on the mats, I've seen the groups who blindly worship their training and uh, they repeat, repeat it without even uh, seeing where it leads. And there are other people who use it, who use it to be better uh, physically and mentally. That's, I think, the, the main uh, idea of, the, of this story and I've seen really people who have seven to eight dance and they are just repeating the stuff of, uh, of uh, color belts and they think they are getting better uh, they might be faster they might be stronger but the, the martial art is, is not uh, progressing anywhere that's what I meant all right now I got two last questions um, second last question, form versus substance or form and substance uh, in, in martial art training. What are your thoughts? What's more important? Whatever. Bill? I think form is important, but I think substance counts when someone's putting their hands on you. People so, don't like saying don't like Nikar Joe, don't matter if you're playing it like perfectly for like a gear on Wazir, it's still going to work on people that don't expect that feeling, assuming they're not high on drugs. Okay, so, so you know, we, we thought in, in this system of Aikido that we do, you know, straight back, straight leg, everything has to be sharp, right? That's the form. Does that get in the way of creating substance? Because we're looking at that, and unless we've got the straight back and whatever, oh, it's no good. Well, well you know, when we've been on seminars with Mustard Sensei, he can do an Ikajo bending over on one leg with his knees bent and his arm up here, so... Oh, no, he's yeah. a bit of a freak. I, I, he's doing stuff that I, very, very few people can do. I'm talking about yeah. the average Joe like you and me. Uh, well, the truth is, um, you're not an average Joe. <laughs> Um, the truth is that it, for me, if I've put a Nicaragua on somebody and I've not been in like a, a strong stance because of a situation, it's still somebody still felt that. Um, but if we train hard enough with correct form, when we're doing it under pressure, surely then our form will should be there. Okay, Andre Sensei. Well, I think it's in any young, um, both together, and there are times when the form is more more important, and then comes the substance. So for me, the form is number one. And if you have a God of form, more or less, not absolutely no one has it. 
uh, absolutely. Then you can uh, f go further to the substance. All right. That's my opinion. Paul, Sensei? What, what do you mean by substance? That's a very vague word. Do you mean strength or do you mean the ability to put someone on the floor? I, I think a lot, a lot of people now, uh, they, they, there's, two, there's two things to this, right? One, a lot of people now, um, they, they've got beautiful technique. Technique's wonderful, amazing, but there's no substance behind it. They couldn't make it work. So if, if for example, you know, I, um, there, there's a lot of instructors, Aikido instructors, who've got wonderful technique, but if you bail them up against the wall, they piss themselves. If you bailed any of us up against the wall, we'd kick you in the nuts first before we even thought about anything else. That's the substance. So, okay. so, so strength, resilience, and yeah. Um, uh, I think form is really important for developing and teaching and to develop the art or to develop your Aikido. Without form, you can't do that. You can be a really strong person with a lot of substance, <laughs> and your Aikido is non-existent. But, so in order for Aikido to develop, you have to have form, um, but then form only just form is, is, um, is something else. It's, it's dance, you know, it's, uh, there can still be beauty with form, but you need to have substance as well. So they're both important and form is, you have to have form in order to develop. Substance. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the correct form leads you to substance, gives you the substance. Yeah, so I think so. That, I, I believe with what Andra Sensei said, it, it's yin and yang. You, yeah. you want to improve your substance, then you study the form. And then you take the form further. Uh, they feed into each other. And someone told me once, you know, 80% of all technique was confidence. So going back to what Andra Sensei said, it's the same. Once you have that substance, you have the confidence and then the form works better. And we've all seen that. We've all seen that. So also, I, I think, yeah, very much yin and yang. But also substance is important to us for because of what we've done in our lives. And it's important to other people that come into the dojo too. But some people will come to the dojo, the substance is never going to be in their agenda. They're never going to expect themselves to be fighting somebody or defending somebody even though it could happen just because they have a car accident or whatever. But for them, they just want to come to the dojo, train hard, work on form, work on bettering their own core, uh, core stability and making themselves mentally in a different place to where they were when they came. So I think as well, it depends on what your expectations are. Yeah, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong. Sorry, Paul Sensei. Go. Yeah, I, I was just going to say substance is a real difficult one because a lot of the guys that come to my dojo... Um, a lot of the time I'm trying to teach them form over substance because when they use substance, they use muscles in completely the wrong way to do Aikido. Do you know what I mean? Because most people, most guys, they, as soon as they feel um, confrontation or they, they feel resistance, they go straight into the resistance. That's how they've been brought up. You know, I'm going to be stronger than your resistance by yeah. going into it. And that's so what Aikido is be. Substance is not necessarily strength or power. It could be the the intent behind the technique. Mm. You know the, the intent, in, and it's uh, it, it's just little things like someone doing shomeuchi, and you don't block, and they stop there. If I if any of you did shomeuchi, I didn't block. You hit me. That, that that's the substance, and and I think uh, it's missing at the moment. Uh, but anyway, regress. Uh, so yeah. okay, last question, gentlemen. Uh, if someone wants to join the police force, right? What would your advice be to them? And also, would you recommend they do some martial art? And if so, which martial art, why? So it's a three, three thing question, yeah? Uh, Paul, you get to go first this time. Yeah, I'd, well, I mean, there's, lot, there's, there's so many aspects to it, really. Obviously, I, I favor Aikido. Um, but it depends what suits them as well. And it also depends what instructors they've got available because, you know, having a good instructor in, in Krav Maga, for example, could be the one for them. Um, you know, I've never the... seen those sensei. Sorry? I've, I've never seen those sensei, good instructors in Krav Maga. And I have seen even Den Dennis Hanover 
uh, the, the head of the, the Krav Maga from, uh, from Israel. Sorry, <laughs> I'm too mean. <laughs> Okay, but it depends on it depends on the circumstances of the individual. But find find a good teacher, and find, and it depends how many hours they've got to train, and um, you know it's a it's it's such a, a massive question. Um, I, I think judo is highly un, underrated. I think judo is very good, and judo and jiu-jitsu. Okay. And to, but doing anything is better than doing nothing. You know. But you didn't answer the first question. Would you encourage someone to join the police force? What would your advice be to them? Yeah, I, but yeah, I had a good time in the police force. Yeah, and, and you should, yeah. Although it's funny enough, I think I was about 35, 40 when I truly felt that my own personal morality and integrity matched what I was doing at work in most cases. Sometimes it didn't, you know? Sometimes I felt it didn't match, but it took quite a long time to sort of grow into it rather than just going through the, the legal obligations. All right. Phil, you go next. Yeah, I, well, I sort of agree with the third part, what Paul said, as I said, that, you know, it's about finding the right martial art for you. But I think within the police, what we're trying to do, uh, striking arts not necessarily applicable for, for that role. Um, I think doing a martial art is a good thing for police. And I don't... We, I've had so many police officers that have come to the dojo that I've trained for a few weeks and stopped because shifts and everything else and life's a bit too hard for them to fit it in. So I think, that, you know, that's, that's poor, really. But, yeah, I definitely recommend. I'm proud to be a police officer. It's something I'm really proud, proud to have done. Um, and, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy if my boy turned around and said he wants to be in the police. Are right, you just saying that because you're still serving? or? No, genuinely, I'm proud. I'm proud to be. I mean, I was in the British Army. Or two, uh, so I went from army to police. I'm, you know, so I'm proud to have served my country in both them aspects. All right, Andre Sensei, would you recommend people join the well, police? Well, it it's very simple. I highly recommend that. I recommend to start from the very bottom, uh, from the street, working like a cop, and then go maybe to the other areas of the police job. And uh, concerning the martial arts, uh, I also highly recommend that any martial art, any, well, as uh, here was said, uh, with a good instructor, which is, I think, much more important rather what kind of martial art are you studying for police, for self-confidence, etc., etc., what, what was said before here. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, the hour and a bit's gone really fast. Uh, it was really good, thank you. Sorry if I niggled your answers a little bit. Um, everyone, hashtag keep the flame alive is, is, uh, is not just a hashtag, it's, it's about keeping the traditions alive, not, not just being conservative in our thinking. I'm not conservative, but I'm a traditionalist. And that's what it's about. It's about showcasing Aikido. And I, I, you know, nearly everyone I interview is a friend of mine. And more than anything else, Aikido has given me that depth of friendship. So. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being on here. And everybody watching this, if you like it, the only way we can keep these interviews going is if you subscribe to Ike TV. That's our only source of income. Uh, these will at some point be put onto podcast and go on to that as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Next week, we have uh, an Aikido instructor who's also a lawyer. And he's going to talk about the the pitfalls of running a dojo, what you need to look out for, et cetera, et cetera. He's also a very funny person, um, not just to look at, but in, in a manner as well. Uh, his name is Kelvin. He's from Singapore. And please tune in. Thank you very much, everyone. Os. 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 Os.